welcome to podcast stories. When desperation sets in, doubt often follows. Questions plague the mind, what could have been done differently? How did I end up here? I believe my options were limited. How does one persuade an adult to reconsider actions that jeopardize all they cherish? One can only witness, powerless, as events unfold. This is where I found myself. My beloved wife believed our love needed a grand gesture to prove its strength and significance. Yet, to me, it revealed her selfishness and lack of genuine affection. I am but an ordinary man leading an ordinary life, flawed like any other. My focus often strays, consumed by work and fleeting emotions. Such is the nature of existence, where obligations and unforeseen circumstances intervene. For 19 years, Amanda has been my wife. Our intimate moments, frequent and fulfilling, were a cornerstone of our relationship. Despite life's distractions, we always made time for each other's desires. Our daughters, Olivia and Audra, aged 16 and 14, added richness to our lives. While I may be unremarkable, they are extraordinary. Our marriage flowed smoothly until my wife entertained newfound notions. We're plain vanilla, she said, and we need to spice things up. I was game. I wasn't at all unsatisfied with our sex life, but hey, if she was, I'd play along. At first, it was different positions. I was athletic and in good shape, and I enjoyed the hell out of it. This was great, awesome. I was down with all of it. Sex was great, everything else was spectacular. Next, it was role-playing. I had no idea where that came from, girlfriends, women's magazines, or some moronic TV show. It was fun for about three times, and then it was just stupid. I had too much trouble concentrating when I was inside a hot woman to maintain my Leonardo DiCaprio character or remember that she was Scarlett Johansson. I refused to do it anymore. Suddenly, she was displeased. Corwin, how long has it been since you went on a date? She asked one day. Last Friday, I took you out to that Italian place you've been wanting to go to, I said. We went to the movies, and your mom kept the girls overnight, remember? I don't mean with me, she said. How long has it been since you went out with someone else? Jesus, Amanda, are you accusing me of something? I asked. No, no, honey, that's not it at all. I just wonder if you remember the name of the last girl you went out with besides me. Yes, I do, I said. Her name was Donna, and it was about two weeks after I met you. I think you might remember her too, we kind of had a big argument about that date. Do you ever miss it? I asked. God, no, I laughed. I remember how awful it was. Not that date, it was pretty good. But the whole dating thing, working up the nerve to ask a girl out, worrying about being shot down, awkward first conversations, it was traumatic as hell, more like absolutely terrifying, I said. What brought this on, Amanda? I was just wondering if you ever felt like you'd like to go out on a date with someone else, she said. No, I've never felt like that, I told her. I guess everyone has fantasies, but no. I seem to remember you being extremely pissed off when I went out with Donna, and you told me you wanted us to be exclusive. I decided that's exactly what I wanted too. If I felt differently, I wouldn't have asked you to marry me. That's what being married means. You don't go on dates with people other than your spouse. She let it drop, and I didn't hear any more foolishness for a month. It was a Friday night, and we had just finished making love. It was good, and no pretending to be Bobo the Clown or tying her up or some silly stuff. It was just her and me, a man and his wife, screwing each other's brains out. I came twice, and she must have gotten off half a dozen times. She was laying half on top of me and we were kind of floating in that post-orgasmic bliss, and then she blew the mood. Corwin, I saw how CRA was looking at you tonight. She wanted you to ask her to dance. CRA is our friend from where Amanda works, we've known her forever. We'd met her, Angela, and another friend from work for dinner, and then we'd gone out to a club. CRA is a really sweet, really hot lady about five years younger than us. Well, that's very flattering, but I only want to dance with you, I told her. I wouldn't be jealous if you asked her, she said. That's nice, but then you don't have any reason to be, because I'm not going to ask her, I said. Would you be jealous if I danced with another man, she asked. I guess your brother would be okay, I said. It was a joke, but she didn't laugh. I've never cared if you dance with guys who asked me nicely and kept their hands where they belong. Was there someone that you wanted to dance with? I don't remember anyone asking me. 
No, I was just wondering, she said. I had no idea where this was going, but I didn't like it. I didn't think I could get to sleep, so I got up and went into the den. I was playing a video game when I saw her come to the door and watch me for a minute. I didn't look at her, and she went back to bed. I waited until she was asleep before I joined her. Everything was quiet for two months until we went to Angela's promotion party. It was at the White Rhino, and there was a good band playing. We were all sitting around in a big circular booth, and Amanda was talking to CRA. SB wants to dance, Amanda said. Would you be a gentleman and dance with her? What the hell, I remembered the conversation from two months ago. Now I was in a very awkward position. She was a good friend, and I didn't want to hurt her feelings, but I sure as hell didn't want to dance with her. That lush body up against mine wasn't going anywhere good, but I didn't know how to get out of it gracefully. I like to dance, but I'm not any good at it. She was like a big cat, graceful and smooth, and I was going to look clumsy. There wasn't a good way out, so I stood up. I think they're playing our song, I held out my hand to see, and she slid gracefully out, brown gorgeous thighs flashing below the short blue dress she was wearing. The song ended, and the band started up a slow number. Why now? She fit up against me like she was made to go there. I could feel those luscious big breasts against my chest, and her mop of black curls was nearly covering my face. She smelled nice too. When she looked up at me, her big brown eyes were liquid pools, and her teeth flashed white against her dusky complexion. She isn't a dark black girl, kind of a coffee with cream color. Thanks for dancing with me, Corwin, she said. Amanda said you wouldn't mind, that you like dancing. I haven't danced since I broke up with Bruce. Well, you're a very good dancer, I said. Actually, I do mind dancing with you. See, I like you a lot. Hell, I love you. You're the sweetest girl I know, but you're smoking hot, and this isn't a good idea for me. You're safe with me, Corwin. I love you too. If you weren't married, I'd be all over you, but Amanda is my best friend. Let's just enjoy this one dance, okay? I squeezed her a little, and we finished the song. When we got back to the booth, Amanda wasn't there. I looked around and spotted her black and white dress. She was out on the floor with some young Nordic-looking guy. She was laughing up into his face, and his hands were a lot lower than they should have been. She noticed me standing and looking for her. She smiled and shot me a wink. I was pissed. Very pissed, in fact. She had sent me off with CRA so she could dance with that a-hole. I threw a couple of twenties on the table and started walking toward the exit. CRA watched me halfway to the door, and then she came running after me. She caught me when I was about halfway to the car. Corwin, stop. Where are you going? She was a little out of breath. We were being played, I told her. Amanda has been talking about dating other people and asking me if I ever thought about it. That's what this was. She's testing the waters. She set me up for this by getting me to dance with you. That gave her the excuse she needed to dance with Romeo in there. So, what are you doing? She asked. Are you just going to leave her here? That's exactly what I'm going to do, I said. Well, you can't leave me here. I rode with you guys. I felt like a heel. I'm sorry, I said. See, I don't know. What I was thinking. It's okay, Corwin. I don't like being played any more than you do, she said. Take me back to your house so I can get my car. We were nearly home when my phone buzzed. I ignored it, and CRA gave me a look. Her phone went off, and she answered it. We're nearly to your house, she said. She looked over at me and mouthed, Amanda. No, it wasn't my idea. I rode with you guys, remember? My ride was leaving, and I wasn't about to be stranded, I said. Look, Amanda, I'm not in this. Don't you put me in this position. We've been friends a long time, girl, but if you screw with me, you'll regret it, she ended the call. She wants you to go back and get her, she said. Well, I want a wife who doesn't play stupid games, I sighed. Where did this come from? See Marcy from work, I think, she said. She's always talking about her and Herb having an open marriage and how great it is how it's made their sex life so much better, and their marriage so much stronger. It's a lie. She and Herb hardly talk and spend all their time trying to screw all their friends. He's been hitting on me as long as I've known them, the creep. She's been filling our ears with this crap for two years. 
I didn't think Amanda was stupid enough to fall for it, but I guess I was wrong. I think she's trying to set us up, Corwin. She knows I love you and that I've always been really attracted to you, she nearly choked. Thanks, C. This is really awkward. I mean, I think you're gorgeous, but I'm a one-woman sort of guy. I'm not good at sharing my toys either. I'm sorry she got you involved, I said. Why should you be sorry, she asked. You didn't have a thing to do with it. I got to dance with my dream man, and I'm not at all sorry about that. Corwin, will you let me know what happens? I assured her I would, and she got in her car and left. I went into the house and thought for a minute, then got my stuff out of the master bath and put it in the one in the guest room. I went back, got my stuff for work the next day, and put it in there too. I locked the door and went to sleep. For some reason, maybe the drinks I'd had, I went right to sleep. I half woke up when the door slammed downstairs, and I heard footsteps in the hall. The knob to the bedroom door twisted a few times, then someone tapped on the door. Corwin, what the hell is going on? I heard Amanda's stage whisper. I guess she didn't want to wake the girls who were asleep just down the hall. She tapped and whispered for about ten minutes, and I heard her footsteps retreating down the hall to our bedroom. Well, it had been our bedroom. I had no idea what it was now. I discovered that I hated the bed in the guest bedroom. I mean, how many people have ever tried to sleep on the bed in the guest bedroom? I tried to get up and slip out the door before she woke up. Yeah, it was a coward's plan, but who cares? I just didn't want to see her. It didn't work. She came down the stairs as I was putting some files in my briefcase. What the hell is wrong with you, Corwin, she sputtered. She was mad all over. I think you should be asking yourself that question, I said. What's that supposed to mean? She was a little loud. You left me at the club last night, locked yourself in the spare bedroom, and you're trying to sneak out of the house an hour before it's time for you to go to work. Now you think something is wrong with me? Yeah, that's exactly what I think, I said. I picked up my briefcase. Everything I did is in reaction to what you did. I don't even want to look at you right now. You have no idea how close you are to making me permanently pissed off at you. Get your shit together, make sure all your points are checked off, and be ready to talk about this when I get home. I'll pick the girls up and take them to mom's house. We're going to settle this, her face went pale. I have no idea what you're talking about. What if I had something planned tonight, she said. Up to you, I told her. If you're interested in fixing what's broken in this house, you'll be ready and you'll stop with it if you're fine with the way things are, do whatever. The hell you want? Oh yeah, one more thing, move yourself into the spare bedroom. I like my bed. You aren't welcome in the same bed as me. She puffed up like a toad, but I wasn't going to listen to it. I just left her there and went to work. I picked up the girls from school, and they were happy to go to Graham's for the evening. I told mom that Amanda and I were having some problems, and we needed some time to ourselves. She just hugged me and told me she loved me. I was grateful not to have to answer a bunch of questions. Amanda was there when I got home. She'd made cookies, and there was a plate of them and a cup of coffee waiting for me. She stood up and clung to me for a long moment before kissing my cheek and sitting down beside me on the sofa. I helped myself to a cookie, they were very good, oatmeal with chocolate chips and MNMS in them. Good, I said. She smiled, and it seemed like we were off to a good start. I hated her to spoil all this amicability. Amanda, that was some nasty thing you pulled last night, I told her. It's bad enough that you did that to me, but you got Seth involved. That was humiliating to both of us. It was disrespectful to me and to that sweet girl who's supposed to be your friend. She had trouble meeting my eye. I'm sorry, Corwin, she said. I shouldn't have done that, okay? I've just been trying to talk to you, and you've just shut me down. I thought maybe, maybe this would be a way for you to see some possibilities. Possibilities for what? I asked. What is it exactly that you're doing and thinking, Amanda? Just ask me. Tell me. Or whatever. You're playing games, and it's pissing me off. She hesitated for a minute and then just blurted it out. I was just thinking that we might try dating other people. Well, there's a little problem with that, I told her. Actually, there are several problems. The first one is that both of us happen to be married. Other married people do it, she said. Things aren't like they used to be. Lots of people have open marriages, and they love each other more than ever. 
it just makes their love for each other stronger. How do you know that? I asked her. Everyone knows that, she said. The girls at work talk about it all the time. Are these girls married? I asked her. Yes, she said. That's how I know about it. Give me a name, I said. Marcy, she said. Marcy and Herb have an open marriage, and their marriage is stronger than it's ever been. How do you know? I asked her. She told me, she answered. Well, that definitely means it's true. How do you know she's not lying? I have an idea, I told her. Let's look it up. Google knows everything. Let's take a look at all these loving, open marriages. She seemed a little shocked, but she came and sat beside me while I fired up my laptop. I got the browser open and typed in how many people have open marriages. I had no idea what we were going to find, but I wanted to know. Now I clicked on the first link. According to the survey we read, less than 1% of Americans have open marriages. We checked several other links, and the result was the same, less than 1%. I think she had expected something different, I said. That's still a lot of people, she said. That's 3 million, at least. That's not right, I said. I doubt very many children are married, open or otherwise. Okay, let's try this, I suggested. I typed in how many Americans expect their partners to be faithful. We clicked the link and found out that it was more than 95%. So what do you suppose that means? I asked. I guess that most people aren't very open-minded, she said. I thought there'd be more people with alternative lifestyles. I hear about it all the time. I wonder how many of those open marriages end in divorce. Want to see? I asked. I don't think she did well. I did and I wanted her to know. No, I typed in how many open marriages end in divorce. The answer turned out to be that 92% of open marriages end in divorce in five years or less. Okay, I said, let's see. Less than 1% of Americans are in an open marriage. That means that out of a million people, fewer than 10,000 are in open marriages. 92% of open marriages end in divorce. That means that out of that 10,000, there are 800 that don't end in divorce in five years. That's 800 out of 1 million. Amanda, you do the math. If 92% of 1% fails, how many successful open marriages are out there? What are the chances that ours would be one of the ones that work? Her voice was quiet. Not very good, she said. The paltry few that do succeed are the ones where both parties are on board. I told her, look at the screen. 100% of the ones where one party is coerced into doing it fail. Ours would be one of those because I'm sure as hell not doing it willingly. Can you imagine how my feelings of resentment, competitiveness, jealousy, insecurity, betrayal, and lack of security would affect us if I were to allow this? The only possible reason I would do something so absurdly painful would be if I were desperate to keep you. I'm not that desperate. Other women are attracted to me, one told me so last night. If I were some pathetic loser that couldn't get a date or a sick freak that likes watching his wife screw other men, maybe I'd be interested in playing your game. I'm not that man, Amanda. I'd rather you shoot me in the head than break my heart. I don't think you can believe everything you see on the internet, she said feebly. No, you're probably right, I said. I think a good bit of it is probably, especially the part about things are different now, lots of people have open marriages. That's the part you shouldn't believe. Do you think you can believe everything that Marcy tells you? How many times has she been divorced? How about her husband? How many times has he been divorced? I don't know about him, she said quietly. Well, what about her? I asked. Four times, she said quietly. So, you're taking marriage advice from a four-time loser? I asked incredulously. It's not like that, she protested. She and Herb have a really strong marriage. I don't know what happened the other times. Maybe she married a-holes, or maybe she's the a-hole, I said. I was disgusted with this. I asked. See where all this crap was coming from, she said. Marcy talked about this all the time. I also found out that Marcy and Herb hardly speak to each other and spend all their time trying to have sex with their friends. How do you think this is going to end, Amanda? What exactly do you think you're doing? Well, don't you think our sex life has been a little bit stale lately, she asked. No, I don't, I told her. I've been perfectly happy. 
How many times did you climax the last time? Half a dozen, she said. It's gotten weird because you want to play stupid games. Wait a minute, were those Marcy's idea too? I could tell by the look on her face that they were. Jesus Christ, I exploded. They were her idea? This is effing unbelievable. We have a really strong marriage. This could be so good for us and so exciting, she said. We could come home and tell each other about our experiences and it would be so hot. Don't you have fantasies about me being with another man and then coming home and your brain's out? Lots of men have that fantasy. It's in the top 10 male fantasies. I exploded more like a nightmare. How do you know lots of men have this fantasy? You want to give it a Google? I don't know who's into this, but it makes my skin crawl just thinking about it. You do any of that and we're through, Amanda, I said. She looked shocked. What do you mean we're through? Do you mean you'll divorce me? Is that all our marriage means to you? I thought you loved me more than that. I thought our marriage was strong and you'd be open to things. Yeah, well, I thought it was strong too, I said. Apparently it's not as strong as I thought. The fact that you're even talking like this tells me that our marriage doesn't mean to you what? What are you going to tell the girls? Mom and dad are splitting up? Are you going to tell them why? We're not splitting up, she said. If we were, it would be because their dad doesn't love me enough to accept the fact that I have enough love for him to allow him to have other relationships. Guess again, I said. What they would be told is that their mother doesn't love their father enough to keep her marriage vows. She doesn't love them enough to make sure they have a good, loving home. Their mother wants to be out and doesn't give a damn about anyone else. We were both angry now, and she promptly nailed the lid on the coffin. I want this, she said. It's going to happen, Corwin. You might as well get used to it. You can either go with me on this journey or you can sit at home and pout like a baby. That's where you're wrong, I told her. We're not going to survive this, Amanda. The first time you screw someone else, I won't be sitting at home. I'll be speaking to a lawyer. I'm going to give you a couple of options here. One, we can just forget everything, and I'll talk to an attorney in the morning. We'll be divorced as soon as possible. Two, you can make an appointment to see a therapist in the morning to find out why you're back crazy. Right after that, you can make another appointment for us to see a marriage counselor. We'll try to fix this mess. I'll go to counseling too and work with you, but I'm not at all hopeful. This is the big screw up, Amanda. I've seen this coming ever since you started getting weird ideas. I think that which Marcy has been feeding you a lie, and you've obviously swallowed it. You think all these good things are going to happen. All that's going to happen is that you're going to make everyone you say love miserable, the girls, me, and you. We all are going to suffer because you've somehow built this idea up in your mind. Believe me, I won't be sitting at home. What are you going to do about it? She was taunting me now. You can't stop me. You don't own me and I can do whatever I want. You won't divorce me, you have too much to lose. I'll get the girls in the house, and you'll be paying alimony and child support. Think about this, Corwin. Don't do anything stupid. I love you. I'm never going to leave you. This can be so exciting for us. We'll experience the thrill of all those first times without any of the risks or downsides. I'll come home, or you'll come home, and we'll be there for each other. I'll be so hot that it will be the best sex of our lives. Come on, baby, let's just give it a try. If you aren't happy, we'll stop, and that will be the end of it. She stood up, came over to my chair, and tried to wrap her arms around me and kiss me. I pushed her hands away and stood up. Don't touch me, I told her. I need to think about this. I'll let you know what I decide. I lied. I didn't need to think about it at all. I just needed to get my ducks in a row. She was probably right about everything she'd said concerning divorcing her, that whole system is messed up nine ways from Sunday. I needed to make some moves. I left her there, went up to the master bedroom, and locked the door. After being on the computer for 30 minutes and on the phone for 10, I had a plan for the money. The problem was the girls. I checked, and under Georgia law, we lived in Atlanta, children over the age of 14 get to choose with whom they live. I was betting on me. Audra was a slam dunk, she was daddy's princess, always had been. Olivia loved me, I knew that, but she thought a lot of her mother too. I knew there was no way Audra was going with Amanda, and I didn't think Olivia would want to be separated from her sister. 
I was betting that if I could get them to hear what their mother was planning, how she planned to use them as leverage to force me into this open marriage, they would want nothing to do with her. Yes, it was cynical, and I hated every thought I was having, but I wasn't the one changing the rules. That's what it amounted to, if Amanda had come to me before we got married, told me she wanted to stay faithful to each other for 19 years, then start screwing other people, would I have married her? Not a chance in hell. I'd have been out of there like a cat with its tail on fire. She knew it, and she would have done the same thing. Now she wanted to change the rules and force me to go along with it. She was threatening me with what she was going to do if I didn't. Had she come to me, told me she wanted to screw around and wanted a divorce, I'd have been hurt badly, but I would have done the decent thing. We'd have split everything up, figured out a custody agreement, and that would have been the end of it. Not after this extortion. The conversation happened two nights later. Amanda didn't know the girls were listening from the stairway. She started by apologizing. I wasn't buying it, so you've decided to see a therapist and start marriage counseling? I asked. There's nothing wrong with me, she snapped. It's you that has the problem. You're planning to have sex with other men, and I'm the one with the problem. I'm not planning anything, I said. I don't have some big plan worked up to go out and have sex. I mean to date anyone else. I'm not even expecting that. I just think we should have the option if it comes up. I have a different idea, I told her. Just so you know, I have had opportunities to cheat on you occasionally. It's not every day, but a dozen times down through the years, I've had my chances. Do you know what kept me from doing it? What? She asked. I did have a plan, I told her. I was planning not to cheat. I went into every one of those situations with the plan that I wasn't going to do it. That's what being married is all about, planning to have a good marriage, planning not to have sex with other people. If you don't plan to succeed, you're planning to fail. Isn't that what they say? That's what you're planning to do. You're planning to betray all the promises you made to everyone, me, your kids, God, and everyone else. How do you suppose the girls are going to take that? You're not going to tell them a damn thing, she hissed. You know the mother always gets custody of the kids. I'll take them away from you, and you'll never see them again. I'll make sure that every time you have a visit, something will come up. You better not breathe a word to them. She glared at me and stalked off somewhere. I heard a couple of faint gasps from the stairs and a muffled sob. Amanda was making too much noise to hear it. When I got to the stairs, the girls were gone. I went up to Audrey's room, but it was empty. As I walked down the hall to Olivia's room, I could hear low voices inside. I knocked, and Olivia asked me what I wanted. Can I come in? I asked her. She opened the door. Come in, Dad, she said. We thought maybe it was Mom. They had both obviously been crying. I sat down between them and wrapped both of them up in my arms. I'm so sorry you had to hear that, I told them. I didn't think you would believe me if you didn't hear it for yourselves. It's okay, Dad, Olivia said. It's not your fault, it's her fault. I didn't believe you. Well, I didn't think you would lie to us, but I thought maybe you'd misunderstood her. We know now. How could she do that to you? How could she do it to us? I don't know, baby, I told her. I don't have a freaking clue. She's not thinking straight. She's been listening to a bunch of bad people and their stuff at work. She's decided she's going to do it, and that's it. I've tried everything I could think of to talk her out of it. She doesn't care. Do you think she's sick? Audra asked. I have no idea what makes her tick anymore, I said. I tried to get her to see a therapist. You heard me. I offered to go to marriage counseling. She's just not interested. What are we going to do, she asked. Nothing right now, I said. When she decides, I've given up, she'll probably go on a date. When she does, we'll be ready. When she gets back, we'll be gone. I'll try to talk her out of it. I don't think she's going to listen. Are the two of you with me, or do you want to stay with her? They looked at each other for a minute. No, Dad, we're going with you, Audrey said. My heart leaped 19 years and in disappointment, but here was the reason I was going to be okay. I wouldn't regret a single minute as long as I had my babies. It took almost two months, they were the weirdest two months of my life. Amanda and I hardly spoke. We were like roommates who didn't like each other very well. She slept in the spare bedroom, and I slept in what had been our room. 
I tried to talk to her, convince her of the madness she was bent on. We were weeding the garden one evening, and I broached the subject. Amanda, do you feel like this plan of yours is working out? Is our marriage getting stronger? Where's all that hot sex you mentioned? Is this exciting, fulfilling? Is this what you thought was going to be so great? Is this what you had in mind? She looked over at me, and I saw the first hint of doubt in her eyes. It quickly turned to anger. If you weren't being an a-hole, it wouldn't be like this, she snapped. I don't want my wife planning to screw other people. She insists that she's going to do it, whether I like it or not. I'm being the a-hole here. Yes, you are, she practically shouted. You won't even think about how great this could be for both of us. It doesn't have to be this way. You could just forget about your stubborn man pride, and everything would be perfect. Perfect for whom? I asked. It sure as hell isn't me. This is as bad as it could possibly be for me. You obviously don't give about me. I love you so much more than you love me, she said bitterly. I love you enough to allow you your freedom, allow you to explore boundaries, and keep your place in my heart. I don't see that as love, I told her. I happen to think it's selfishness. I love you enough not to exercise my freedom, not to have sex with other people, explore any boundaries. If you really love me, that's what you'd do. When did you stop loving me, Amanda? I didn't, she started crying. I love you more than ever. That's how I can allow this. My love for you is stronger than you'd ever believe. So, love is you driving a stake in my heart? That's love to you? I asked. That's not what I'm doing, she was furious. Now I'm going to the club with Bill White from work Friday night, she said. See, BR is going with us. Please, Corwin, come with us. Give it a shot. I promise you won't be disappointed. It will be the hottest thing we've ever done. I pretended to think it over for a minute. Okay, what the hell? You're going to do it anyway. I guess I might as well go along for the ride. She was across the garden in a flash, her arms around me, her body pressed against mine. Corwin, she sobbed. God, thank you, sweetheart. I was going nuts. I didn't think you'd ever even consider it. You won't be sorry, baby. I promise you'll never regret this. I was regretting it already, but this situation was intolerable. I couldn't go on like this. I wondered if C would help me. I decided to give her a call. As it turned out, she was mad as hell. She had no idea what was going on when Mandy asked her to go clubbing. She didn't know Bill White was going to be there, and she sure as hell didn't know she was being set up to be with me. That 304, she said when I told her. I'm calling her now, and she's toast. Do you trust me? I asked her. What the hell is that supposed to mean, she sputtered. Calm down, I told her. I need your help. I know you're upset, but I really need you to help me. This is the dividing line. I'm leaving her. We'll be divorced as soon as possible. I'm ready, but I need your help. I'm going to play along, and I need you to play with me. I could hear her breathing deeply into the phone. What do you have in mind? She asked. I'm going to pretend I'm down with all this, I told her. I'm going to ask you to go home with me. All you have to do is pretend you want to. She laughed. How do I know this isn't some devious plan to get me in your house? It is, I told her. I need you to take the girls to my new place while I get our stuff out of the house, I said. That brought out the wicked side in her, and she agreed that her vengeance could wait. I hadn't been aware that she had a vengeful side, but it was going to work for me. All that week, Amanda had sex with me like there was no tomorrow. Friday, there wouldn't be a tomorrow for us. She was wild, telling me over and over again how great this was going to be and how much I was going to love it. I tried one more time Friday morning before I left for work. Are you very sure about this, Amanda? There's still time. You can still call it off. Hasn't this week been great with just us, Corwin? We've already been through all of that, she replied. If it turns out you don't like it, we can talk afterward. But I'm not changing my mind. She smiled at me. Yes, Corwin, this last week has been wonderful. I've loved it, and I love you. Tonight will be the best yet. You'll see. Thank you for doing this with me. You're going to love it, Corwin. I know you will. She danced her way out of the bedroom. Right, 
I thought sourly, let's get this day over with. When CRA stopped by the house on Friday evening, she was absolutely stunning. Amanda was cute, petite, and slender with a face that belonged on a teenager. CBRA was in a whole different league. She was tall, and she had one of those bubble butts you hear so much about and almost never see. Amanda was a bit flat back there. CBRA had on a short, tight red sheath dress with sequins all over it. She just looked amazing. I was wearing a sport coat and black pants with a ribbed t-shirt under the coat. She looked me up and down when I let her in. She grinned slyly at me. I know you're trying to get in my panties, she said. Well, yes, but not tonight, I said. This is all business. I'll have to wait for the panties. That's a shame, she said. I'm wearing a thong, and I think you'd like it. Show me. I pulled her close against me, putting my hands on the hem of her dress and gradually easing it up her long, beautiful legs toward that amazing ass. Stop that. Amanda could come in any time, she whispered fiercely. Exactly, I said. We want her to think I'm playing her game. I continued to slide her dress up and over the firm contours of her ass. She giggled and tried to push my hands away, but I was relentless. Just as two of the most beautiful sights I'd ever seen popped into view, and I was about to give them a squeeze, Amanda walked in. She squealed and jerked her dress back down. Amanda just smiled. You two are getting an early start, I see. Save it until after we dance and then get a room. I've already got a room, I told her. How about you and Bill get the room? She smirked at us grabbed her clutch, and we were off. Bill met us at the club. I don't think the evening started the way he'd expected. I shook his hand and just crushed it. I've been powerlifting for years, and one thing it does if you lift without straps is it gives you quite a grip. I could see him start to go weak in the knees, and I let him go. You could tell he wanted to whimper and nurse his hand, but his macho image wouldn't let him. He was one of those pretty boys. Have you ever noticed that as men approach what some women would call ideal, the likelihood of there being a hairdresser or a Scientologist goes up to near infinity? Just look at Tom Cruise. I wondered about Bill. Say, Bill, you don't happen to be a hairdresser, do you? I asked him. He snorted. Hell no, he said. Those guys are all gay, yeah. I know I said he looked like he might want to make something out of that, but his hand hurt too badly. You know who L. Ron Hubbard is? I asked. Himes, how did you know? He asked. I've been a Scientologist for six years, I shrugged. Just testing a theory, I said. She was about to choke, I had mentioned my little theory to her before, and she was about to burst out laughing at any moment. We both looked over at Amanda, and she was beat red with fury. Maybe I'd shared too many of my private theories with her. Let's find a booth, she said, and stalked away with her back as stiff as a poker, Mr. Bill in her wake. As soon as he was ten feet away, C.R.A. burst out laughing. I grabbed her arm, and we followed them, with her wiping the tears from her eyes. You're a mean man, Corwin, she gasped. Yeah, well, this is a hell of a night, I told her. Compose yourself, act like you're seducing me. She did a good job of it too. I was more than halfway seduced by the time we got to the booth. Watching that fantastic ass undulate in front of me. I decided I was all the way seduced by the time I danced with her twice. She was doing everything but screw me on the dance floor. Amanda was out doing her thing with Mr. Bill when we got back the second time. You ready for the big show? I asked Zebra. She looked up at me with those tilted up eyes, a look in them that told me this wasn't all a game to her. They were huge and luminous brown, and I felt myself falling into them. I saw those full, luscious lips part slightly, and her little pointed tongue came out to moisten them. I couldn't help myself, I had to taste her. It was everything I thought it would be and more. I heard a noise, and Amanda and Mr. Bill were sliding back into the booth. Oh no, I said in my best Saturday night live voice impression, look who's back. CRA got it, and so did Amanda, but Mr. Bill was oblivious. Don't do anything mean to him, sluggo, S.E. chortled. Amanda swelled up like a puffer fish, and the little smirk vanished off her face. See, and I are going to get out of here, I told them. You kids have fun now. Amanda walked us to the door. Are you sure you're okay, Corwin, she asked. You were being kind of a dick back there. No, I'm not okay, I told her. Mandy, it's not too late. 
you had your fun. Just walk out of here right now with me. We'll go home and try to work things out. If you stay, this is for keeps. No, Corwin, she said, this is going to be so great for us. Just go and enjoy, see. It's going to be awesome, you'll see. Just try not to be such a dick, okay? Yeah, well, it's not my two you're interested in, is it, Mandy? I said. We both know it's Mr. Bill's dick. Good luck with that. We're out. She grabbed my arm. This is going to be so great, Corwin, you'll see. C is hot for you, you can tell me all about it when I get home. Aren't you spending the night with him? I asked. I figured with a stud like him, he'd go all night. Well, I guess I might, she was a little hesitant. I thought I'd get home around midnight, and then we do our thing, you know, spicing things up. Oh right, I slapped myself on the forehead. I forgot. Well, see you when you get there. If C and I are still, you know, banging, try to be quiet, okay? She gave me a look and kissed me. I hope she enjoyed it, it would be the last one. I went out and got in the car, C was waiting. You sure you know what you're doing, Corwin, she asked. You've been married a long time, I said. Yes, I'm sure, I sighed. I expected you to be more upset than this, she said after a while. You just run out of juice, I said. I was upset for a long time. I'm just sick now, tired and sick. I just wanted it over somehow. I've lost the energy to be upset. I've cried gallons of tears, and the crying time is over. It's time to move on. Let's go get the girls. When we pulled up, the moving truck was already being loaded. The girls were carrying their clothes downstairs and packing them in big plastic tubs. We weren't taking much furniture, just the bed out of the master suite, the girls' beds, their TVs and electronics, and the big screen we replaced six months ago with a bigger one. When the girls finished packing, she took them in her car, and they drove to our new place. It was about as far from the old one as we could get and still be in the same school district. The guys finished packing, and I took a last look around. It looked empty and silent, the ghosts of nineteen years were all that remained. I sighed, took off my wedding ring, and dropped it on the kitchen table along with my cell phone. The girls' phones were already there, and it was time to go. I felt the melancholy close in. I was going out with a whimper, a few petty jabs at Amanda and Mr. Bill, and I was walking away from 19 years that had been pretty damn good. Oh well, happens. I locked up, loaded my tools from the garage into the back of my truck, and I was gone. The girls were pretty excited about the new place. It had a pool in the backyard, and they couldn't wait to try it out the next day. Do you like that, Bab B? I asked Audra. Yeah, I do, she said. I had no idea what the hell he eat was, but it sounded good. S was there, and she still looked amazing. But if she had been Jennifer Lawrence in the flesh, I was just tired. Not that I'd prefer Jennifer Lawrence to S, you understand, but you know what I mean. She sensed that, I think, and she just gave me a dazzling smile, a quick peck on the cheek, and she was gone. The lingering smell of her perfume was the only reminder that she'd been there. We went to bed, and surprisingly I slept, not well but I did sleep. I got up and made coffee the next morning, and the girls came in after a bit. We had a Danish Kringle and chocolate milk for breakfast. They watched cartoons on TV until noon, and then two gorgeous little bikini-clad bundles of energy were splashing in the pool while I sat in a lounger and watched. I wasn't really paying attention, I wondered what Mandy was doing. She'd be frantic by now, I was sure. She was probably calling everyone she could think of, trying to figure out what had happened. She was going to have a tough time finding us. I wasn't working, I'd sold the business and made out like a bandit. The girls weren't in school, it was summer vacation. We weren't going anywhere except to the grocery store, and we walked and took a bus there. The truck was parked in the garage. I was sure she had the police looking for us, but not driving a car, they were going to have problems. The only way she had to get in touch with us was electronically. She filled our inboxes with messages. I and the girls read them every time they signed on to social media and sent tweets and messages on Instagram. We read them but didn't respond. Let her find us the hard way, I knew she would eventually. But she had to work and pay bills. I wasn't making any payments, and if she didn't, she'd get behind in a hurry. We had a good bit of equity in the house, and I knew she wouldn't want to lose it. 
I guess she got desperate because a private detective came up to me in the grocery store one day about three weeks later. Mr. Decker, he asked, who wants to know? Your wife hired me to find you, he said. I'm going to tell her where you are. You should give her a call. If I see you around, I'll have you charged with stalking. I told him, me? I wasn't about to call her. It turned out that I didn't have to. The police turned up, and Mandy had handed them a line that I had kidnapped the girls. They asked me to go down to the station and sort it out. When I declined, they arrested me and hauled my ass downtown. The girls went in another car, and when we got to the station, Amanda was there. She tried to hug the girls, but they weren't interested. They pushed her away, and a woman came and got them and Amanda. They went into one room, and I went into another. The cops started questioning me as if they had a hard-on for me. I identified myself, they already had my driver's license, and the only other words that came out of my mouth were, I intend to remain silent, and I want to speak to an attorney. That shut them up. He's lawyering up, I heard one of them say. They gave me a phone, and I called John Trimble, he was there 45 minutes later. S was with him. We had this planned. It took about three hours to sort everything out. The girls said that they were with me because they wanted to be. There was no kidnapping, and they didn't want to speak to their mother. John took care of it from there. He pointed out that there was no court order on custody, that under Georgia law, both parents were considered equal candidates for custody, and that children over 14 could choose the parent with whom they wanted to live. They had no choice but to let us go. S walked out with us, and Amanda was trailing along behind, pleading with the girls to talk to her. They got in John's car and drove away, leaving the two of us alone in the parking lot. Amanda was crying buckets, and she looked like a mess. She turned those forlorn eyes toward me and fell to her knees. Corwin, for God's sake, talk to me. Please, I'm begging you. I seem to remember begging you not to screw Mr. Bill, I said. You didn't listen, why should I? Please, Corwin, don't treat me like this, she wept. I'm sorry, okay? Could we please just go somewhere and talk? Okay, let's talk, I said. Where do you want to go? Home, she pleaded. Could we please just go home? I don't want to go anywhere anyone can see me like this. We can go to my home, I told her. I don't have any interest in going to yours. I don't know who you've been screwing there. She gave a little wail of dismay, but she nodded her head. Okay, Corwin, whatever you want, she said. But it's your home too. I wasn't going to argue with her. She wanted me to ride with her, but I wasn't about to be stuck in a car with her. I called a cab, and she followed me home. Here's the corrected version of your text with errors and punctuation fixed. I knew the girls were with Sebra, and they were spending the night. They'd known her all their lives, and they were getting very close. Amanda came in, and I got her a cup of coffee. We sat at the bar, and the silence stretched uncomfortably. Silence hadn't been uncomfortable between us since our third date, but it sure was now. What do you want, Corwin? She finally asked. Did I say I wanted anything? I asked. I mean, what do you want me to do? She said. What do I need to do to get you to come home? What do you want me to do so I can see the girls? Hey, I have no control over you seeing the girls, I said. This was their choice. What did you tell them? You told them something. You've been poisoning them against me. I read about this. Are you sure Marcy didn't tell you that? I asked, her eyes dropping. Obviously, Marcy was the oracle of all wisdom. What do you want? She repeated. You know what the funny thing is? I asked. The funny thing is I haven't said one word to them about you. The only thing I told them was I was leaving you, and they needed to decide who they wanted to live with. You want to know who told them? Amanda, you did. You're the one that told them. What do you mean? She asked. I haven't said anything. When would I have said anything? Remember that night in the living room when you threatened me? I asked. I could see she did remember. They were sitting on the stairs, they heard every word you said. Her face went pale, and she started sobbing. I didn't mean it, she sobbed. I was just, just. She couldn't continue. Well, they think you did, I said. As a matter of fact, I think you did, too. I guess the majority wins. What can I do? Her pleading was pitiful. Mine had been pitiful, too. With them, I have no idea, 
and I don't give a damn, I said. You screwed it up, you fix it. What can I do with you, she asked. Well, you could file for divorce, I said. I don't want a divorce, I just want you to come home. I am home, I told her. I don't live with you. I'm sorry, Corwin. This was all a big mistake, she said. I never should have forced you into this. You didn't want it, and I should have just accepted that. I do accept it now. Can't you just forgive me, and we can just go to that marriage counselor? I'll go see a therapist. I'll do whatever you want me to. I'm sorry, too, I said. The problem isn't that I didn't want it. The problem is that you did. What I want you to do is file for divorce. I'll give you a little while, in a few months if you haven't filed, I'm going to. I want nothing to do with you, Amanda. Since you're the kind of person who could do what you did, we're done. You thought you could hold the kids over my head and force me to be with you. You thought you could hold me hostage and do whatever you wanted to do. Now you've figured out that you can't do that, and it's too late, Amanda. File for divorce, you bastard, she exclaimed. You stole all our money, you sold the business, and our bank accounts have maybe $50,000 in them. Half of the money you took is mine, she accused. I never touched a dime of your money, I told her. I sold the business at a huge loss because I had to do it quickly. I took only the money I earned. You know what? I don't have a dime of it left, that was all very true. It was safely stashed away in an offshore account. I had figured out that the time to do that is before the divorce. The records showed that I'd sold the business to a Danish company for less than I owed in taxes. I'd also seriously overpaid the IRS, and they were keeping the money to go against future tax bills. Our brokerage accounts hadn't been touched, and I knew I'd have to give half of them up. I'd started a trust for the girls, and they were going to be sitting pretty for three months. I'd been hitting every grocery store, Walmart, and convenience store in town. I'd used my debit card, and every time the machine asked me if I wanted cash back, I said yes. $60 and $80 a pop at all those stores, with three people doing it at every place in town, we could have added up pretty quickly. The great thing was all those transactions were legit. I had a huge stack of cash in an old chest in a storage building. Once the coast was clear, I'd start using it. Amanda, you have the house, I told her. We have enough equity built up for you to sell it, get out of the mortgage, and do just fine for a while. Maybe after you sell the house, you can move in with Mr. Bill. I wonder how his wife would feel about that, she gasped. I didn't know he was married. No, you didn't care that he was married, you wanted an open marriage. Maybe he has one. It's time to move on, Amanda. File for the divorce, we're done, I stood up and walked to the door. She followed, wringing her hands and crying. She stopped at the door and looked up at me. Tell the girls I love them and I'm sorry. Will you please do that for me, Corwin? Yes, I'll tell them, I said. I'm not going to give up, you know. I'm not filing for a divorce because I don't want one. I want you back home where you belong. I wish you were a little more open-minded, Corwin, but I see that's not possible. I never intended it to be like this, I never thought you were serious about not even trying. I still think if you would have just tried, you would have found out that you liked it. But I see now that you can't even try. I still love you in spite of that, and I'm going to keep trying. I was too tired to argue with her. I saw her out the door, took a minute to collect myself, and called Sebra. She brought the girls home, but she didn't come in. Audra and Olivia were very upset and even angrier with their mother than before, if that was possible. I knew they wouldn't be at all receptive to the message from Amanda I had for them, so I decided to just sit on it for a while. Two days later, Amanda showed up about 4.30 with dinner. She'd made a chicken tetrazzini with French-cut green beans and a big basket of garlic bread. Olivia opened the door, Amanda tried to hug her and got a stiff arm for her troubles. Hi baby, Amanda began. Dad. Olivia called loudly, you need to come out here. Olivia's mother started, I'm so sorry baby. I love you and I've missed you so much. I just want to. Olivia shut her down, I don't want to hear it, she yelled. You don't do what you did to people you love. Stay the hell away from me. She stalked away and Amanda nearly collapsed. I rescued the basket with the food in it she was carrying and pulled her over to the sofa. She sat down and buried her face in her hands. What have I done? She sobbed. They hate me, Corwin. They won't even give me a chance. 
Well, what you did to them was pretty hateful, I told her. I doubt they'll ever trust you again, Amanda. It may be possible for you to build some sort of relationship with them. I won't stand in the way, but this is on you, not them or me. I made dinner, she looked at me pleadingly. I felt sorry for her. She did it to herself, but she was hurting. I've never been one to kick stray dogs. Let me go talk to them, I said. Find the dishes in the kitchen and we'll see what happens. Thank you, Corwin. I need a tissue, she said. I got her a box and went up to talk to the girls. They were steaming. I can't believe she just showed up here and said, what did she think? She could feed us and then everything would be okay? She destroyed our family. I know, kitten, I told her. Here's the deal. She tossed in the hand grenade, and now she has to deal with the shrapnel. She still doesn't get it, she still thinks I'm the one with the problem. That's okay. I can live with that. I'm not going back to her. I want you to stay with me, but if you want to be with her, that's okay. Nothing will ever change how much I love you too. I'd rather hang myself, Olivia said. We're staying with you, Dad, she continued. I hugged them. Do you think we could go down and eat with your mother and be civil to her? I asked. Would you like us to? Olivia inquired. Yeah, I do, sweetheart, I affirmed. Just try to express your feelings without being hurtful, all right? Can you manage that? They both nodded in agreement, and what followed was perhaps the most uncomfortable dinner in history. Amanda attempted to engage the girls in conversation, and while they responded, it was with brevity. We tidied up, packed Amanda's belongings, and she prepared to leave. May I give you a hug? She asked Audra. No, Amanda, I'm sorry. I'll speak with you if you wish, but you're no longer my mother from now on. Both girls then retreated to their rooms without saying another word. Amanda was utterly devastated. It took her thirty minutes to regain her composure enough to depart. It was heartbreaking to witness, but I couldn't help but feel satisfaction. She continued to visit about once a week, but each time, the girls dashed her hopes. Despite her persistence, she didn't file for divorce or cease her attempts to persuade me to move back in. After six months, I initiated the divorce proceedings. Upon its finalization, Amanda perhaps finally grasped that our relationship was over. The court granted her visitation rights, yet every time she sought to visit, circumstances arose preventing it. I genuinely hope she found someone more compatible with her lifestyle. As for myself, I remain unmarried, dedicating my life solely to my daughters. Dear listeners, we invite you to share your thoughts in the comments section below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share.